Hi, I'm Chris Short. I'm a senior developer advocate at AWS. I work in open source at AWS now, so off Kubernetes exclusively and onto the entire open source ecosystem. This is a new job for me, um, but it's going to be fun. So today we're going to talk about burnout, but during the talk, there's going to be many triggering things. And I might not hit on all of these, but as people come in, I want you to read this list real quick. And if any of these situations apply to you, including the moderator, we can, we can make it through this talk without you, I promise. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, here's my trigger warning list because we're going to talk about my real life stuff, OK? And it's kind of gruesome to a point. Um, Trying something new for accessibility purposes, you can get the slides and look at them now and follow along and see all the notes and see what I missed. Because um, <laughs> I am doing this from mostly memory. Now, I realize we're in the EU, and uh, this is a US statistic. So, you know, for the EU, it's hard to get a read on burnout because there's a different study in every country at a different time. One thing I did notice is. Western Europe has a lower burnout rate than Eastern Europe. I imagine there's some history there behind that can, that can explain it. However, um, it was like a gradient almost, like good to bad. <laughs> so uh, be uh, friendly to your fellow Eastern EU people. But uh, so, you know, I needed a number. And I figured, well, the EU is at least 10% more awesome than the US, like easily. OK. So that means about half of us in the room are either going to or have experienced burnout in some sh way, shape, or form. When I was making this talk, I realized I suffered burnout multiple times. Um, and that's why I put this slide up there. So the, what is it? What is burnout exactly? That's the only way we're going to figure out how to fix something is to identify it, right? So we feel exhausted. We have no energy, and we feel like we can't do good work. Like, those are three key points. You become, now this is how you act, you become cynical, you have negative attitudes towards your projects. We also experience disassociation from the projects and the people in our lives. This is where things got weird for me. Um, and then ultimately, you feel ineffective Burnout makes you just feel like you can't accomplish much, even though you're probably being highly productive without even realizing it. Um, in other people's eyes, you just need to ask and kind of get out of your own bubble sometimes. So I originally said even kids deal with burnout, but I'm just going to say everyone deals with burnout because, of course, kids deal with it. We're all humans. Um, I'm going to tell a story now, personal story. Uh, well, this is what my brain looks like when I'm burned out. Uh, my burnout manifests its way in three, four different ways. Anger, anxiety, sadness, or depression. That's like the more depressed, the more anxious I am, I s feel myself getting closer to burnout. That's experience talking. But that was my head before I got a therapist, basically. All right, so... <clears throat> burnout, what is burnout plus? It's when you're already burned out, with or without realizing it, while having another event happen that could make you burned out. So open source contributions are something that I know can be exhausting. You know, after reInvent and KubeCon and end of year reporting and all that stuff we need to do, by the point I'm to that point, I'm like just so done for the year because I've done like three conferences in a row and now it's December and I'm ready to just unplug. So, but you know, you can get, have an injury that can cause burnout. You can have anything that can cause burnout. Um, as I was just discussing with Sarah, if somebody passes away, death is a cause of burnout for others sometimes. So you have to be careful. And even just a missed opportunity can create, or at least be a, exclamation point on a series of burnout events. So I had an early life encounter with Burnout Plus. So I was in the Air Force from 1999 to 2010. The week before 
Monday, my grandmother died. Wednesday, I was hospitalized with flu-like symptoms. Thursday, my best friend passed away at the age of 20. Um, here's some headlines from his college at the time. It's really hard to see these words associated with your best friend. It's incredibly difficult to have a friend go through a drug overdose, especially when they were young, because you're, you just sit there and you wonder why. Well, as we slowly put together the, uh, the picture of his life and what it looked like in the last few minutes, none of his friends were aware he was dealing with shingles. If you don't know what shingles is, I've had it. It sucks. And I'm only 43. It's like supposed to happen to people in their like elder years. It, it can be a stress-induced thing. Um, so he was 20 years old, as I mentioned. He was a student at the University of North Carolina. And he just got rejected from their prestigious business school. It's prestigious as it is, whatever you want to call it. It was a big deal to him. He worked really hard, and he got rejected. So he went to go blow off some steam. It's a college campus. We don't know exactly what he did. The toxicology report showed us what he did. A lot of drugs, which, okay, fine, it's college. You know, those are those years. Um, but then he went home and went through his nightly regimen of stuff he was taking for shingles, which included an opioid that put him to permanent sleep. So he never woke up. That's how he died. That's a nice way to go in the grand scheme of things, but when you're 20 years old having just dealt with the hospitalization of <laughs> grandmother dying and you're in the military, I was 21 at the time, um, that was a lot. I didn't even know it. I didn't even realize it. Um, so, yeah, it bothers me today, but I've had many years of therapy so that I can talk about it now without getting emotional, without becoming angry or anxious or sad. So it's, um, it's something that needed to be defended, and someone did. So this person is a very important person in this journey just by writing this. Um, I didn't know them, which I think is the best part, so I reached out after they wrote it, and I said, thank you. Then 9-11 happened on the Tuesday after that. Now, as you can imagine, being in the Air Force on 9-11 was really, really weird. Um, I watched the second plane hit the towers live because I was already awake. As Kim knows, I wake up very early in the morning sometimes. Um, and I watched the, the second tower get hit, and I told my ex-wife at the time, I'm getting in the shower, because we were at my parents' house just coming back from this funeral, um, I'm gonna get in the shower, if they hit the Pentagon, we're leaving, like immediately, and like five minutes later, they hit the Pentagon. I was like, okay, we need to get home. I was attached to a unit that provided communications to other units while they were out in the field. All of a sudden, our services became very important because we were one of very few facilities in the US where you could get all the services you need to set up a secure data center for the Department of Defense anywhere in the world. So when we first went in into Afghanistan, people were bouncing a circuit off a satellite over Afghanistan to Europe, and then again to another satellite over the Atlantic to the US. So really long chain of technical problems we had to solve there. But my life changed because I felt like the US intelligence community failed us. So what did I do? I dove in. Uh, that's what I usually do. I try and fix stuff. So I joined a very exclusive unit and we did a lot of hard things. Um, and I went back and I recounted all the stuff I did before I was medically separated. And like these are all major life events. And you can see them happening in my early childhood years, my teenage years, all the way till I'm 30. Like any of these one things could have <laughs> been a source of burnout. Uh, but that week after 9-11, pretty much 
took my burnout and turned it into fuel, like jet fuel, basically. And I worked really, really hard, got assigned to this prestigious unit uh, well before I should have been, rank-wise, um, because they needed expertise like the ones we were providing folks in the field. That's what this unit did. It just did the opposite side. It went out to the places to set up the bases as opposed to being the facility that they reached back to. So I got on the uh, other side of the spear, basically, is what they called it. Um, but I moved around a lot as a kid, all in the southeastern U.S., but I went to three different high schools in four years of high school in the U.S. Yeah, like not because of discipline, not because of bad grades, just because I moved. So that alone, right, like I was done with high school and burnt out on school, education in general, and most of my family's teachers. So I did this. And I do realize I don't necessarily look like that anymore, but someone did tell me I'm still looking like an Air Force person this morning, so I need to fix that. Um, so let's talk about being a disabled veteran. So in 2003, I had just gotten back from 10 months in the Middle East, and we had to do a hurricane evac exercise. This was like October, so this is the dog and pony show, essentially, of <laughs> hurricane evacs, which you would think, why do you need to practice a hurricane evac when most of your units actually deployed? Well, there's this thing called the color of money in the US government. If you designate money for a thing, you have to spend money on that thing. And that color of money will never change. And they're like general categories, right? Like, um, you know, morale raising things operational things, strategic things, tactical equipment, you know, there's all this color of money. Anyways, there's even congressionally written laws that dictate the level of disability you are and dictate how to measure a disabled person's part. It's range of motion, pain levels, all these things put together to give you some kind of scale on zero to 100 of disability. This is the mortality rate of veterans in the US. <clears throat> this weighs on me. The goal is to beat the odds, right? Um, you know, when the VA described me as a disabled veteran, it changed the way I saw myself. Like I knew I hurt, I knew I felt bad. I didn't realize it was actually permanent until they said, no, really, here's your disability rating. Um, yeah, everything down to like how you get disability is congressionally controlled in the US. So here's what's actually wrong with me. And to give you an example of how bad the uh, Veterans Administration is in the US, this is the first thing they did with me once I got to a real doctor inside the Veterans Administration system. They wanted to prove that I was actually in pain, as if the records and years of stuff wasn't enough. They took this thermal image. This shows variation in skin temperatures, like on a very, very small level. Like red is bad. White is really bad. So you can see red and white up here and here. What does this mean? These are all inflamed areas due to injury. That's how this camera worked. It's, a, it's not like mirrored, so it looks like my right shoulder when it's my left, or vice versa kind of thing, but basically even they didn't trust me after I got to them. So it's like, oh, they had to verify that everything was right before me until they can treat me. So once they saw this and three other students at the time, because I'm always here for, to help people learn, um, you know, they, they're like, we're not gonna be able to fix this. This, this is not something we can just fix. You're going to need treatment. You're going to need lifestyle changes. You're gonna need a whole bunch of stuff. So I'm here to uh, testify disabilities suck. It sucks to get them. It sucks to deal with them. I have no days off from pain. I'm in pain right now. It's pretty low, but I'm in pain. Um, it changes the way you think. It can also short circuit the way you think. I don't get any days off from it, period. Me standing here is just a testament to the 
modern medicine that I got myself out of and started using private insurance to treat my things. So I talked about the VA, how bad it is, how awful it is. I've been through two VA disability rating appeals already. I'm about to go through a third. And the first one took four years. The second one took three years. But I've got a really good plan to help me get you know, out of burnout here. It's called hiring a lawyer. He's going to go do that work. He's <laughs> or they. I don't know who they are yet. I haven't called because I've been putting it off all month because it's that bad of a process. <laughs> but I'm going to call a lawyer's office when I get back. And they're going to do the work for me. Because that's the only way you can do it these days. They've made it so hard for veterans to get any kind of help that you have to have lawyers fight for you if you actually want to be represented well. That's scary. Because normally they just hand you a piece of paper and say, fill it out. And that's it. They don't give you any advice. Their job is to deny you so they can have more money for something else. They're not incentivized the right way to protect people. So, okay, all the statistics aside, this is the one that I'm driving towards right now. Uh, U.S. veterans already have a higher rate of mortality on average. The disabled veteran mortality rate is even worse, age 67. That's like, it's weird to have stats like that that are like specifically geared towards you, about you, and the average age you will die at. So like if I make it to 72, did I beat the odds? Maybe, kind of, right? Like I'm still in that 10 plus or minus window. So that is the daunting number that I face right now. That's 24 years from now, I should be okay, right? No, how far, Never mind. I can't do math, 17 years. Um, all right, so what is burnout plus plus? Being burned out without realizing it while having multiple burnout inducing events occur all at once. What does this sound like? Sounds like that week before 9-11 and the week of 9-11 put together. But other things can do this. Toxic family members, buying or selling a home. That is stressful, really stressful. Um, you know, global pandemics are tough too, I've heard. We've done that, everyone in here. That, that was tough, layoffs, all that stuff. So don't learn the hard way. Hopefully that's why you're here, so you don't get burned out. Um, so I did it wrong for a number of years. You know, like any good person going through the VA, I was like, something's wrong here. And eventually it got to the point where other people were telling me something's wrong here. You need to go see a psychiatrist. It's like, fine. But they were just throwing more and more meds at me. At the age of 31, I was addicted to morphine thanks to the VA. Actually, I had to go to a hospital one night because I was going through withdrawal and didn't even realize what it was. Had no idea that that would be a problem. They didn't prepare me for a life of opioids, right? Like, no one tells you, like, this is how your life's going to be and it's going to suck and you're going to have these problems. And Yes, the whole epidoid, uh, opioid crisis is awful and terrible, but... Uh, I'm a victim of that process correction because now it's harder for me to get the meds I need to just get through the day. So I actually have to use two different pharmacies right now, which is nuts to me because the pharmacies in the US, two of the big ones, they've been sued for malpractice because of the opioid crisis and as such, they're not buying as much. And that means I have access to medicine problems. That's anxiety inducing. Especially when you can go, I take three medications that I can suffer withdrawal symptoms from. Even worse. So, going back to the VA, every time I came home, I came home with a new prescription once a month. It was nuts. Um, my wife, Julie, she's part of the reason why I'm here today. She said, literally, and I quote, I feel like they're only going to keep giving you pills until you aren't yourself anymore you go away, meaning you leave the VA, or worse. Okay, fine. I was taking painkillers and anxiety medicines, which aren't really a great mix. They're kind of frowned upon, actually. <laughs> so I'm getting off of one of those. But I had this perception problem with the world. 
My glass was always half empty. Didn't believe good things would happen until they actually happened. I always planned for the worst. I needed to change how I thought about the world. All these things. Thank you. Um, but I had no idea how it all worked in the U.S. like actual civilian medical system because I'd been in the VA for so long. So I had a friend. They were the SIG lead for the SIG I was working on at the time, contributor experience. They knew everything about how to get through to the mental health people in civilian healthcare. She taught me everything I know. Literally, how to find a psychiatrist, how to find a therapist, those two things are hard. I got lucky with my therapist, did not get so lucky with psychiatrist, so that's why I'm on all the meds I'm on, and some of them aren't good for me. So there's a lot of ways to get to that. But the therapy that helped me the most was called EMDR. There's cognitive behavioral therapy, but there's this newer thing called EMDR, which I don't remember the name of, I'm sorry. But it basically simulates REM sleep in real time. And it uses motion and lights, all that stuff. It's interesting. But I was totally able to do it throughout the pandemic from home. It was really cool the way we did it remotely. You need a psychiatrist that gives you medicine in the US and you need a therapist. And you don't necessarily need medicine from a therapist, but they're there to talk to you about how you perceive yourself and how to fix that perception. Um, trying to hurry up here. So this is basically how EMDR works. I had read about it in a Wired Magazine article way back in the day. I had read about it uh, in another article that my wife handed me right before I went to go pursue this. And luckily, I, like I said, I hit a home run with my therapist, the first one, because I knew what I needed. It, I needed to change the way I thought about events in my life so that they weren't so impactful anymore and didn't send me in, into some kind of panic attack. It's not for everybody, it might not work for you, but at least you know it's out there. Um, after, this is how you get rid of it. Like, go find your person in life. Someone that's gonna be there for you no matter what. That is the current partner I have right now, my wife Julie, she literally has been there through all of this. Um, I've had to cut ties with my entire family. I started public speaking at the age of 37 in Detroit, of all places. And then uh, we moved up there. Once I ta stopped talking to my family, we moved to Michigan because it made no sense to stay in North Carolina. And we have the most amazing family network. My son has four nephew, or I have four nephews, so he has four cousins, all boys, all within five years of him. So we're all within this nice little tight area. Um, if there's anything you take away from this talk, take this QR code. There's links at the end of it, all kinds of stuff. But this is what helped me realize I was in burnout and I needed to figure out a way out of it. Thank you. <laughs> so these folks, they make a checklist and they have you do you know, a little survey and they tell you, hey, you're probably burnt out or you have like a moderate risk of burning out or you know what the tolerance is. This checklist changed the way I looked at my world but also made me realize like Detroit was my refuge away from the craziness. I moved up there and left all that behind. I was closer to my daughter who I had in my previous marriage. I was closer to everything that I loved. So it just made sense. But, and I now realize, you know, Detroit gave me the chance in 2016 to do my first public speaking event. And now I'm here in Paris. That's pretty cool, right? Like, that's a great story. So you can be a dude from the middle of nowhere in North Carolina, go through very traumatic experiences, and wind up thriving once your mental health is taken care of. So I've been doing great since we've gone through this treatment, and it started back in 2018. And I'd say we got to a completion point around 2022, summer of, where we had finally processed all these big negative events that you saw before I turned 30. We had weeks of therapy for each one of those. Um, so when I get anxious, a number of things happen now. But I can identify 
when I'm anxious versus when I'm normal. I can identify if it's like too much coffee or if it's a panic attack potentially. It's really cool. But when I get anxious, my blood pressure goes up and my pain levels go up. I have high blood pressure. It's because of the psychological pressure and the physical pain, period. Those are the only two reasons why. Cardiologist certified. <laughs> All right, so <sighs> the best thing about figuring out how your brain works is how to make it stop doing the things that harm you. So accept who you are, accept the situation that you're in. Don't deny yourself of what you are, right? Like don't try and trick yourself out of it. If you need help, go get it. It's okay. I know there's a stigma. It still exists today. That's why I'm standing here though. So thank you to Rejects. Thank you to all of you for coming to this. I really appreciate your time. You can be forgiving with yourself. You can make a list of things. You know, ever since YAML entered my life, lists are nice. <laughs> um, you know, I knew I needed professional help at another level once I made a list of things that were bugging me. It's like there's nobody that could fix this. So I'm going to jump through the next few slides because I've kind of told you the whole story. But I got my therapist. I got my psychiatrist. We're moving forward. You know, we're doing cloud native things here but you can get burned out while you do it, so be careful. All right, if you want a list of everything that was referenced in this talk, and I mean everything, it's on the last slide. The link to the slides are there. All those resources help me figure out how to explain burnout, how to do this talk, how to get out of burnout. It's gonna be something different for everybody. So there's not one good answer. But if you read all those, I hope you can find your answer. And then I'll go back, so hang on. Thank you all. Is there any questions for you? I will be around.